you hit on the recruiting rankings, and I want to get into that a little bit because I, I took some time to try to figure out what the anatomy of a number five ranked recruiting class might look like in 2021 for Oklahoma in particular, but just in general as well, because I have been skeptical about whether or not OU can put together a top five recruiting class. And frankly, the junior college uh, additions don't really help, right? As a matter of fact, if you put the junior college dudes into the calculator, they don't even come up. They don't show. So like the three stars that Isaiah Coe might add, don't show up in the rankings calculator because he's not necessarily a member of the 2021 class in the same way that Mario Williams is, for for instance. And I'm looking to get some more uh, clarity on that from uh, the rankings council in 247, just to figure out how all that stuff works. Because obviously junior college kids, they count towards the scholarship total, so they should count toward the calculator. But that aside, when I was playing with the numbers, and Oklahoma has seven commits in the boat right now, four four-stars. You need about 14 blue chippers. That's four or five star kids. And you need at least two of them to be five star talents, right? That's the, that is the basic understanding and anatomy of your number five ranked classes. Uh, Michigan in 2017, I believe, had 30 commits and 19 of them were uh, four stars, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. Ole, Ole Miss in 2016 had 26 commits. And then I believe 16 of them were uh, blue chippers. And then Alabama had what, what what's a down year for them, just 22 in the boat, finished number five, right, with I believe like uh, 15 blue chippers. And then that, 20, that 2019 year where Oklahoma finished six to LSU, they have 24 commits to LSU's 25. And they have 16 blue chips to LSU's 14. So add another blue chip to that class, and we can conceivably believe that Oklahoma finishes – number five, and I prefer to think of it that way rather than take Brew McCoy away from Texas because I would rather just jump up and beat somebody rather than have to worry about them losing someone because I'm just not built that way. Uh, And then this 2020 class, Ohio State finishes with a really great class and a score of 295 plus, uh, which is phenomenal for number five because the average that you need to hit is about about 289.36, right, for your team score and finishing at 295. I think we all agree is pretty good. So Oklahoma this year would need to add 10 blue, ten more blue chippers to this class, and two of them need to be five stars. And assuming Emeka Egbuka is a lean to, to Ohio State, that means you need to sew up Kamara Wheaton and Caleb Williams just to have a shot at finishing number five. So I wanted to start the conversation there. What would you place the odds on both of those dudes joining up in this class? And that's before you even begin to think about LJ Johnson or uh, – Christian Leary, or any of these other high-value four-stars that you really want to join the OU class? Yeah, I I think you you obviously have to start there, and I think you don't have to go much further than the 24-7 sports crystal ball predictions to really determine the direction of Caleb Williams right now in Oklahoma. 100%. I I don't think anyone's going to kid themselves here. OU Mm -hmm. is in great position to land Caleb Williams, so then it really becomes the Kamar Wheaton thing. And as we know, He's a, he's a Texas kid. He's in that DFW kind of area. Those are kind of my stomping grounds. And from what I can gather, I think Oklahoma's in a really good position. I think that SMU is going to keep in this race because SMU has done an outstanding job of hiring young, energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate coaches who have incredibly strong ties to the Metroplex. And as a result, I think they're going to be able to recruit with the big boys for some years as long as they can keep that staff intact. So then you kind of wonder, maybe Wheaton's the more fringe of the two, but I would call Oklahoma the leader for Kamar Wheaton. Hmm. So when you talk about the five stars and who they have to bring into the class to get to that number five spot that you're mentioning, I'm giving them on those two five stars alone a very solid opportunity to land them. And I will say this, if Caleb Williams, that domino falls and that comes before Kamar Wheaton's decision – I would be led to believe that puts them in even further a strong position with Wheaton if they're able to land that five-star quarterback and sell him on the idea of joining another superstar on the backfield. I like where your head's at. Um, I guess what I'm saying is I need to see it first. And, and yeah, I got one of those Crystal Ball predictions in for one of those guys. Um, But uh, I got to see it. It, Because even with Spencer Rattler, Theo Weiss, and Jaden Hazelwood in the boat, they still – we're just clawing to get to number five. 
So uh, I say that you need those two five stars as a jumping off point because it's absolutely true. And if you're going to be clear about it, you probably need to have three because even with three, Oklahoma still fell short in that sixth spot, even, you know, adding or not adding that mm-hmm. that uh, other dude to the class. The the thing that I also I find interesting about this. All right, so follow me here because I'm, you know, basically going to do a segment right quick, uh, which is I did some looking at Clemson. Because what do people tell us about Clemson? They tell us that they play in a soft ACC, right? Uh, and Clemson has won two national championships in the past five years, and yet we're going to blame the ACC for that. I'm going, no, man, they, they face the same competition Oklahoma faces in the playoff. They just beat people. And then I look at this thing where Clemson has lost just two games in conference in the last five years. Oklahoma has lost two games in conference in each of the past two years with Riley as the head coach. Now, we could talk about Lincoln Riley and and winning five straight Big 12 championships, just like Clemson's won five straight Big 12 championships. And yet in the Riley era, we get at least three, not at least, we get three, like, no, we get four. Yeah, we get four losses. Do I have, let me think. We have 2017 Iowa State. We have... 2018 Texas, uh, just the four. Okay, and then we have 2019 Kansas State because Iowa State, you escape. Uh, Baylor, you get a dramatic come from behind victory, and the rest weren't really that close. All right, cool. I look at Riley and I look at at how the points are scored as well. And I mean, we're talking about the first year that he he was there. I think they scored 48, 48.4 points per game, and then 45.1, and then 43.9 and then 43 and a half, and then 42.1, right? So they're averaging about 44 points per game. And they've shown Down that— here. Right, right. This is the worst year is 42 points per game. But it's True. still not good enough to get you a win in the playoff. And if you want to blame the Big 12 Conference for beating up on you, that's a bad look because you're telling me that the Big 12 Conference is softer than the ACC Conference with that math. Because if the Big 12 Conference is harder to play through, then Oklahoma should win the college football playoff games that they were in, and Clemson should lose them. Like, this should be the inverse. Clemson should be over, and Oklahoma should have two national championships in the last four years. But that's not what's occurred. What's occurred is Clemson rolls through the ACC and then gets wins in the college football playoff and in a national championship game. And let's not forget the 2018 team. Alabama stumped a mud hole in Oklahoma, especially in that first corner when they're down 28-0 and it's not a game. And Clemson rolled that Alabama team up, destroyed them, right? And and that's with a true freshman at quarterback. That's their Spencer Rattler. So, like, there's a difference between being really, really good and being great and dominant. And I feel like because I put my eyes on Oklahoma as much as I put my eyes on anything college football related, period, I'm always going to be have this thing in my ear where I'm like, I'm not going to ignore what I see, right? Because like I'm, I'm not trying to be harder on Oklahoma. I'm just trying to call it the way that it is as opposed to the way that I wish it to be because we're talking about 20 years since since he won, last won a national championship. I was 13, man. Like, I'm I'm grown. I'm, I'm Jesus' age in July. Like, am I wrong here or am I being too hard on this? I mean, what was I, four? So, (laughs) this is probably some justification, Bonham, what you're saying. So, okay, there's a lot to unpack there, and I think you did a really good job of laying it all out. But, okay, my thing is I'm terrified to compare Oklahoma and Clemson. Because, look, I think you bring up a valid point. Why is Clemson playing in what we perceive as a soft conference, whereas Oklahoma's playing in what we might perceive as a soft conference, and yet one team is having more success than the other? My take is, okay, you put Clemson in a lot of different conferences, soft or strong, and they're still going to be one of those dominant football programs in America because of what Davo Swinney and that staff has been able to accomplish. I kind of put Clemson as an exception in the world of college football, but then I also think you have to bring up, okay, Oklahoma is making the college football playoff, and they have the same number of wins as what, uh, Washington, Michigan State? I mean, it, it's – to me, that's where you really have to be concerned. Why is a blue blood program like the Oklahoma Sooners staying on the same level of success as some of the other outlier programs that sneak into the college football playoff? Because that's really the comparison to make is why is a program program like OU being led by one of the most 
competent and smart coaches in America and Lincoln Riley ending up on the same level as some of these squads that can barely see the light of day when it comes to the committee. I mean, I think in order for that to change, that kind of then goes back to our whole discussion of recruiting. I mean, you brought up the fact that JUCO guys and transfers don't really factor in. But I also think that, okay, JUCO guys and transfers definitely have an impact on your squad. And so as a result, that's the niche to be building yourself in right now when you're trying to reach the level of a Clemson or a Ohio State or Alabama. Because bottom line is Oklahoma's not there right now, but they're definitely going to have to find a way to separate themselves from some of those squads that sneak into the CFP unless they want to join that company. Mm. It's it's difficult to really justify the struggle that Oklahoma has seen in the college football playoff. And again, it's something that I don't think we can really compare to other programs. But at the end of the day, I think there does have to be a level of accountability held. And I think that the fan base has done a great job of that. I think the media realm has done a great job of that. I, I would argue that the coaches and players have done a phenomenal job of holding themselves accountable. I mean, We've heard time and again the stories or the quotes from Oklahoma coaches and players. We're not playing well enough in the CFP. We are not playing to the level of Clemson or Alabama. We definitely messed up, or we have to find ways to improve. I think it goes into, okay, you got to land those top-tier recruiting classes, yes. But I also would argue that Oklahoma has finally been able to sort of shred what's held them back. And I would argue that in the past, maybe that was some coaching staff changes that need to be made. Or, or, or some leadership changes, trusting guys earlier in their careers. And as a result, I would say Oklahoma's closer than maybe a lot might expect. I also know that people are arguing to keep them out of the college football playoff because they're struggling so often when they make it. But I think until we see something that, that allows us to say, okay, we can buy this Lincoln Riley stock, we can buy this home stock, because eventually that national championship is going to be won, I think that there has to be some sort of discussion as to why it's not taking place. Because again, I mean, we were both incredibly young the last time Oklahoma won a national title, but we've also endured all of those losses fairly recently. Mm -hmm. And so I understand the frustration behind all of this. I also think it's where I would reiterate the concept of patience because the bottom line here is yes, Oklahoma is a blue blood and it is expected to uphold the standard of a Clemson or Alabama, but it's also going through a relatively new transition, not only a defensive coordinator, But Lincoln Riley hasn't necessarily been an established veteran so far. And I think there are still some things to be learned. And I think you saw that literally firsthand with the squib kick. So it's a tough decision and it's a tough discussion to have. But I think it's one that needs to be had. And I think it's being had inside closed doors. And so am I betting on the fact that Oklahoma is going to be able to get over the hump and, and win that national championship and have that top five recruiting class that we're talking about? Absolutely. But I think I'm a little bit more encouraged than others at this stage that even though it doesn't look like that's on the horizon in the immediate sense, it's definitely there because the Sooners are taking necessary steps to eventually reach that goal, even though in the now it doesn't look so pretty, but eventually it will pay off in my opinion. Allow me to walk out the door with a thing that was hit over my head by a uh a person I dearly admire, longtime Sooner fan, born in the 1950s. He said, Oklahoma, uh, or Oklahoma, RJ, I feel bad for you and your Sooners. I said, why? Because Barry won a national championship in his first three years. Bob won a national championship in his first three years. Lincoln didn't get it done. And it's real hard to win another one uh, when you haven't won the first one. And I said, damn it. <laughs> Like, I, I could have gone the rest of my life without knowing that. Uh, and <laughs> I still hold a grudge over that 2017 season. I still do. Uh, Colin Kennedy, he's awesome. Give him a follow on Twitter at CKennedy247. That's CKennedy247. Uh, I have deleted my Twitter account. Uh, Colin, man, thanks so much. Always fun, man. Let's do it again soon. Right on, brother.